morning, everyone. Thank you for attending. I see here we have about seven participants from the community. So I'm very grateful that you attend and that you want to listen to something that we have to say about preventing falls. My name is Ann Dyke, and I have presented in the Greenwich area before. Some of you may have met me before through Fairfield University. I work with Matter of Balance or just met me out in the community as I do presentations. So my background is I'm an injury prevention coordinator at Bridgeport Hospital, Yale New Haven Health. And in that role, essentially what I do is I take our trauma patients and I go and I look at the number and the types of injuries that occur. So whether it be a car accident or whether it be a fall or whether it be something related to children's poisoning or even gang related violence, my job is to reach out into the community and provide education and solutions on how to prevent trauma or prevent injury. And if we were to go and look on our, we have these trauma databases all over the country. If we were to look at every trauma center in the country, the number one trauma that we see is not motor vehicle accidents, it's not burns, it's not poisonings, it is falls. And that is across most age groups. So mostly in the last few years, I've concentrated on reaching out to our older persons in our community and talking about why we fall and how we stay on our feet and solutions for that. The problem with this is that falling is what we call multifactorial. So there are many reasons why someone would fall. And I have covered it in a previous lecture that I did back in January, some of the more common causes of falls. And today I'm going to focus a little bit more on medications. So for those of you that have medications that you take daily, we're going to talk about the major classifications, we call them, and how they contribute to falls. In the past, I've, I've had talks with environment changes that you can do in your home. I've had conversations about increasing water or increasing your exercise because definitely those are evidence-based, what we call evidence-based solutions for keeping people upright. And that is every age group. And I have had that talk before, so I am almost 100% sure, and Al can verify this, he's our moderator in the background, that that uh, recording is available to the public. So my background is I'm a nurse, and I've been an RN now for about 33 years, and mostly concentrated in the emergency setting. I'll have done work with consultations, and you may guess I have a little bit of an accent. It's, it's, almost gone. I, I think I've almost Connecticutized it a little bit, but I'm Canadian. So I've worked back home on this and I've worked overseas on this and now in the United States. So that gives me a bit of background that this is not an American problem per se. This is a, a global problem. It's almost an epidemic, if you will, because by the year 2050, we are going to have more seniors than we do middle-aged people. And that is our reality. So how do we concentrate more about aging well or aging gracefully. And that includes myself, I'm 50, almost 55. So I'm there and I've said these many conversations to my husband, this is what I wanna do in the house because we are getting older and I don't wanna wait until I'm at the point where it's too late to do, to do some really great changes to our home that makes things safer for us. So having said that, let's move along. And the first slide I'm gonna start with is again, reviewing some of the more common causes. So environmentally, when I think of those types of hazards, I think of inside the home and outside the home. So inside the home, again, pretty common, our little rugs that we have that are beautiful in the bathroom, not so beautiful because when they roll, that is the number one spot that people fall down is in our, in our toilets and in our washrooms. People go in and they trip. And I am guilty of this, in fact, did this last night, got up, no nightlight on, burnt out, and off I go. And I'm feeling down the hallway trying to get into the bathroom. And my first thought was, I'm going to go you know where over you know where, because it's not safe. So poor lighting, of course, in the house is a, is a big problem. And we are very stuck in our kitchens. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I want my microwave above my head. And I want my pots and pans down below. And what happens is we bend over to get our pots and pans and my back may not 
cooperate that day. My ankles, 33 years on my feet, don't always cooperate. And because of these environmental choices that we make, we can fall down. And the number one thing that we see in the kitchen for seniors and children, it's the same thing, are scalds from grabbing cups. And I, I always throw this in as a caveat because I've worked in the burn clinic as well at Bridgeport Hospital. When you have a microwave above your head and you have something scalding, it's just a recipe for disaster. And I've done it to myself. So when we move on and we look at other causes, poor vision and hearing, and why poor vision? I think that's self-explanatory. People don't often check they should. Hearing, tidbit. My mother-in-law and I used to have this argument all the time. She couldn't hear at all towards the end of life and was insistent she didn't need a hearing aid. And that's her choice, which I understood. But remember our hearing system manages our equilibrium and it keeps us upright. It keeps us from feeling like this. So that's the number one reason. The second reason is that when your hear hearing goes down, remember that when we speak or we hear noises around us, and I'm a hand talker, so I apologize. When we speak and we hear noises around us, it truly does bounce off furniture, walls, things like that, and gives us a sense of where we are in the room. If your hearing is gone, then you cannot have depth perception the same as what our eyes do. You tend to be more dizzy. You tend to get yourself off balance. So when I'm talking to people, and incidentally, I'm also in school as an NP and I graduate in a few months. When I'm speaking with people and I'm doing health maintenance with them, the number one thing I say to them is, please consider a hearing aid because it not only helps you hear better, but will keep you upright longer. So feet problems is another issue. Again, uh, I'm married to my very favorite pair of nursing shoes that have absolutely no tread on the bottom. And I tell people all the time, minimum six months, maximum a year, have a look at your footwear. And people love the fuzzy slippers, people love their comfort shoes, but once you lose tread, you lose tread, you're going to slip. And when we look at feet problems, very often it translates into gait difficulties. And when we're tired, when you are not feeling well, we do what I call the shuffle. So we're shuffling and has a lot to do with the fact that people don't wanna fall down. So they're less apt to lift their feet up and do what I call is a heel toe strike. So when you're walking, traditionally your heel hits toe, heel, toe, heel, toe. But when we're shuffling, we're going to trip. So it's more mindfulness and how we walk and how we take care of our feet. Lack of exercises, probably the number one reason why we fall. People are, it's snowing. You're not going to go outside. And I hope you don't go and shovel your driveway if you can't. Or if you can avoid it, stop shoveling your driveway and, and try and get some help for this. Because... A lot of time we get our only exercise and out there shoveling our snow for the first time in a few months. And that's as dangerous as no exercise at all because your body goes into a bit of shock, if you will, that you're forcing it to do something that it's not meant to do at that moment. And I can tell you over the last few weeks, the number of trauma activations, I call them, for people out shoveling or snow blowing and fell in their driveways has doubled. So just to give you a sense of what I look at, when we get our activations, I get a page every time, and you won't be able to see this, but I get a page every time someone falls and they're coming in as a trauma. And in the last two days, we've had one, two, three, four, five, since yesterday at noon. That's pretty slow actually for me getting trauma activations. And the reason why we treat them as traumas is very often patients are on a blood thinner. And if you're on a blood thinner and you fell down and you have a head strike, we will treat you as a full trauma because we don't want to make, we don't want to have a head bleed. So these are our trauma activations that I get. And that's just a small piece of what we get every day. The three last are bolded. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with each of these, because in the previous video that I did, I did speak about exercise. I did speak about environment. And I really want to focus on our medications, infections, and health maintenance and why they contribute to falls or how we can mitigate falls by just paying a little bit more attention. And I'm going to start with physiological changes that are associated with normal aging. 
we have less water on board and that's a natural physiological change. We have more fat, guilty. We have less muscle mass. And these other points below, slowed hepatic metabolism. That means our liver is slowed down a little bit. And that simply means that when your liver slows down and we put a medication into our body, your liver takes its time processing it. You're not in liver failure, it's just a slower rate of metabolism. Decreased renal excretion, and that is our kidneys are not excreting the toxins as well and as quickly as they did when, they were, when we were in our 30s. Decreased responsiveness and sensitivity to the baroceptor reflex. Those are a lot of words to tell you simply that your blood pressure drops faster than a 30 year old. So when you get up too fast, your blood pressure drops much quicker. And that's all that that means. And I'm going to apologize. You're going to hear my dog barking in the back because he's barking at something. So I apologize. So we also do not absorb as well. And if you're one that has a lot of heartburn and you're taking more than four to five medications daily, those are your regular medications. So whether it be a blood pressure pill, whether it be a stomach pill, whether it be something for blood thinner, whether it be a couple of medications for your heart, remember this, that each of those drugs has to pass through the liver and it has to be absorbed and it has to go through a change process. And it can be altered by other medications that are not necessarily prescribed for us. And one of them is antacids. So we think nothing of, oh, I got a little heartburn. I'm gonna take a little antacid. Remember those antacids can affect your regular medications because what happens is it doesn't absorb as well. So the efficiency of the original drug gets pulled behind. Iron can also affect how our other medications are absorbed. It can be affected by disease, for example. So lack of B12 in our system. So if you've had any sort of stomach surgery, then I can almost guarantee that your B12 stores are down a little bit. And as we age, very often we lose the ability to hold on to our vitamin B12 and again can be affected by how our drugs are absorbed. And if you have any stomach issues at all, you may have delayed gastric emptying. And that simply is the food stays in your stomach longer. And when that happens, it can affect the absorption of our other medications that we're taking. There's a lot of medications and a lot of little evidence when it comes to older people. And it, the reality is, is that when we do studies, and a great example is the COVID vaccines, we chose people from this age to about 55, and we leave out our children and we lead out our older population for a reason, because we don't want to get anyone injured that cannot recover. Whereas our 30 to 55 year old population recovers if there's an issue. And I'm not saying the COVID vaccine, there is an issue because there is not. And that's the beauty part of the vaccine. And I don't wanna confuse anyone, this is not a vaccine talk, but just to give you an idea how studies are done. So when I say there's a lot of little evidence, two thirds of our older population are on regular medications. And yet most of these medications were originally studied without looking at the older population. So we had to go back and do more studies for these cardiac drugs on the older population. So adults age over the 65 account for one third of those prescriptions out there, but only 15% of the US population. Older people, again, are not included in clinical trials, trials, which makes it difficult to predict how things are going to happen. So once you are taking those, I can guarantee you almost every medication that you're taking today and it doesn't matter who's here on this presentation, it's been studied and it's been studied very well, very rigorous. When we go through studies, we look at hundreds and thousands of people. So just to give you an idea of how we look at things. So when I said polypharmacy before, anyone who's on four to five medications, we consider that polypharmacy. And because we have a lot of drugs that we take, then there are as a chance for more side effects, more adverse effects, and more drug to drug reactions. So for example, if you take vitamin E, then that may affect your ability to clot your blood. So that is not a drug that I would ever recommend anyone going over the counter and saying, I need vitamin E. I wouldn't ever recommend that 
And the problem with that is that it can interact with your other medications. And the number one thing I can tell you to do if you're concerned is go to your pharmacist, go to your physician or your primary care practitioner, sit down and say, do any of these drugs not get along? Those are important points to remember. And I really think that pharmacists are amazing at what we call reconciling those piles of pills that we tend to take. Poor adherence. And what I mean by poor adherence is either you forget which is adherence or it's unaffordable, completely understand that. Or you say, you know what? I don't feel good on this drug. I've told the doctor and yet the doctor told me I still have to take it. I'm taking myself off it. So we have to be worried about that too because people taking themselves off of medications and sometimes these medications need to be weaned off, that can lead to side effects as well. So this is the dangers of having too many medications. So medications which account for the most ADEs, which are called adverse events. So these are our cardiovascular medications and that would include your blood pressure medications, psychotropic medications, which would include anything that you take for depression, anxiety, antibiotics, believe it or not, can cause side effects, major side effects, anticoagulants. And I touched on that. When someone falls and you're on a blood thinner, then it makes you more apt to bleed and less clotting. And that can lead to bleeds pretty much anywhere. But we see more bleeds in the brain from people falling, being on anticoagulants. And non-opioid analgesics. So that's another big sentence there. That simply means Advils, ibuprofens, any anti-inflammatory, we call them NSAIDs. So those are non-steroidals. It's not a steroid, but that includes Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen. Those are all drugs that can help us bleed more. Or anti-seizure medications. Sometimes they interact or sometimes they cause more side effects than what we bargained for originally. So let's start to talk about the individual classes a little bit. What is hypertensive? Or sorry, what is hypertension? And that simply means in an age group from 65 to 79 years of age, we want your blood pressure to be less than 140 or around 140, but not much less than 140 and greater or equal to 90 on the bottom number. So the 140 is the top number, the 90 is the bottom number. So when we look at the age group of 65 to 79, we want your blood pressure to be a little bit higher than let's say myself who has to run around 130. And those American Heart Association guidelines were set out in the last couple of years where we've tweaked our blood pressure requirements for the older person. And we do that because as I said earlier, older people tend to drop their pressure a little bit more. So we want you what we call riding a little higher so that it doesn't affect you as much when you stand up. 66% of people over the age of 65 have hypertension. That's a pretty huge number when you think about it. But how do we mitigate our hypertension? How do we control our hypertension? Well, the number one thing that any physician, any nurse practitioner, anybody worth their salt, and we're gonna talk about salt, anyone who's worth their salt, the first thing they're going to tell you to do is lifestyle changes. So what do I mean by that? That means you up your, your portions of vegetables, fruits, whole grains. That means your whole grain breads, lean vegetables, meaning uh, lean vegetables, meaning less starchy vegetables, like less potatoes and less bananas as a fruit, for example, and lean protein. So lean protein is important, chicken, turkey, and our fishes. When we look at protein that isn't so lean, I'm talking about the red meats our ground beef, our steak, and I love steak, but I know it's not something I can have every week and I might have it once a month just so that I can keep my lifestyle changes the way that I've said that I wanna keep them. So anyone between the ages of 40 to 75, what the doctor or practitioner will do is they will do a risk assessment in their brain. They may not say it to you, but there's a whole thing of factors that we put down. We put down your age, your gender, your current blood pressure, your current cholesterol, your low density cholesterol, your high density cholesterol. We put them into a, like a little calculator and it tells us what your 10 year risk is like of developing cardiac disease. And based on that, we will say, okay, your risk is this percentage. We need you to do this medication because your blood pressure is here or your cholesterol is here. So they will base 
medications on your 10 year risk. So if you're a smoker, you get a couple of points. And I have to be honest, the number one thing you can do for lifestyle changes, if you're a current smoker, quit. I, my niece is a smoker, she's in her twenties and she was trying to tell me that smoking was actually helping her. And I was like, I think my brain shut off and went somewhere else for a few hours because there is no reason why a 20 year old would ever benefit from smoking. And they say that within eight hours, your lungs already start to clear if you're a current smoker. So when we look at other lifestyle changes, older persons are very sensitive to salt intake. And they did this very, very cool study and I will present it as we move forward on salt alone and lifestyle changes and what it did to lower people's blood pressure. Talk about our tension. I talked about hyper and in the upper limits, but we also have hypotension in our older person population. And that's when our pressure drops a little bit too much. And orthostatic hypotension, and I'm sure most people have gone through this, when you get up too fast out of bed, when you rise out of a chair too fast, you're like, whew, that is your blood pressure dropping a wee bit. It's your body saying you get up too fast. So how do you mitigate that? And this is one of the things that I talk about extensively in almost every lecture. Before you rise out of bed, try and move your limbs, try and move your arms, your legs, and that automatically raises your blood pressure a wee bit, gets the blood moving a little bit quicker. Sit slowly at the edge of the bed and dangle your feet. Let your feet sit there for a few minutes. Let your body get used to what it's supposed to do. And I know it's easier said than done because when you have to go to the ladies room or the men's room, you gotta go. I understand that. It's just so important for people fainting and controlling themselves. If we can get more people doing what I call the dangle method. So what else do we recommend? We recommend that you keep your BMI, which is your, your metabolic index. So if you've ever gone to the doctor and they look at your height and they look at your weight, and they say, well, you're a good 10, 15 pounds overweight. We ideally want you here. Then consider it because when we lose a 10 kilo weight loss and 10 kilos is a little over 20 pounds, we can reduce your pressure by five to 20 points. And this was a study that they finally did on 975 men and women. They were recruited between 60 and 80 years of age and they separated them into weight loss groups, reduced salt groups, and they wanted to know what would happen. And they also reduced, or sorry, separated them into, you're gonna do more physical activity and you're gonna drop the alcohol. Let's see what happens. And what they discovered was these results that I'm showing you here. So weight reduction can drop your pressure. Adopting a diet, a DASH diet. And that is simply a lifestyle change. And the DASH diet is rich in fruits, vegetables, lower your, low, your dairy, your high fat dairy, and reduce your salt content. And if you can do that, you can lower your pressure eight to 14 points. So your dietary sodium, when you think of, and I don't know what 2.4 grams is, I have no idea what that is. What I tell people all the time, is take a teaspoon of salt, that's all you get for the day. So if you're thinking that a teaspoon of salt is you're gonna add that to dinner and you're done, think about the salt that was in your breakfast. Think about the salt that was in your prepared lunch. And I love soups. And I love the odd meal that's prepared for me that's quick and easy and I'm out of the house or I'm off to a meeting, but the salt content in them as a preservative is huge. Makes us retain more water and it drives our pressure up. So physical activity, I've touched on it. If you were able to have any sort of exercise and this, is not, this one's a tough one because the American Heart Association recommends, if you can believe it, 150 minutes a week. That's actually a lot when you think real hard about 30 minutes a day, can I pull that off? And many people will say, sure. But then when they try to do it, have a lot of issue getting it done. So I'm from the mindset of don't try and set the bar too high. If you are a non-exerciser, try things that are feasible for you. And if it means exercise in a chair, there are many programs that offer those. If it means Zumba, if that's who you are, go for it. Tai Chi is probably the number one studied exercise and I promote it almost every class, every course I teach. Tai Chi, great for balance, great for lowering blood pressure and great for stability and flexibility. So if you can find these classes, get in them. I think they're so valuable. 
The final group that lowered their alcohol intake, interesting, for two to four millimeters of mercury or two to four points on that scale when we're pumping it up. So these are really interesting statistics and they were done on a roughly a thousand people of age that I'm talking to right now. So I'm not talking five minutes, 20 minutes ago when I said, hey, you know what? We're only studying this age group. I'm talking about your age group. So another classification that gives us a bit of a run for our money are antibiotics. And I know as a young nurse, as an older nurse, what I expect of, a, of my primary care provider. And the moment I get a bit of a fever and a sore throat, I used to think, I am sick, I need an antibiotic. 41% of adults, these are adults, and I'm not saying any age group, believe that if they get a cold, they should get an antibiotic. That's a surprising statistic. I didn't think it would be that high. When in fact, a, a cold is a virus and there's nothing an antibiotic will do to fight a virus. It's strictly bacterial that an antibiotic will fight. 34% agree that an antibiotic will help with a cold. So not only do they expect it, but they believe it's going to help. That's another huge statistic that scares me a little bit. And among these who filled their prescription, 13% reported they keep their leftovers. And I say that kind of cringing because they want to keep them for a future infection. 60% want to keep them for, for future infection. So I have a little bit of backup in case I don't feel well next week and I know I can't get to my doctor. I'll just take a couple of those big white pills they gave me and I'm good. And that scares me because antibiotics themselves, if we start to hoard them and we don't complete the course of them, then we develop a resistance to them. So the next time you get sick, that antibiotic may no longer work because your body said, really, we didn't need it, but we don't like it now. And we're not going to let it play in our bodies any longer. So infections in an older person are very important to talk about because we can have altered barriers as we grow older. Our skin is not as robust, it's thinner, and our lungs are not as robust. There are issues there. Some people have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Some people have long-standing asthma. Some people have had a, a long history of exposure in their workplace to asbestos and to things like that. And our, gastro our gastrointestinal tract is also altered a little bit. So I, I know that I see this all the time is that we have a decreased defense to any infection at all. And we have a decreased response to vaccines. So they'll be very interesting as we move forward if people start to not react, not react well, but they have the ability to get the COVID vaccine, but they're a little bit worried because of their defenses. And what we're seeing is that is not necessarily so with the COVID vaccine. So that's very interesting, but we do see it with the flu. So for those of you that get your flu shots, the reason why we give you what I call the McDonald big sized influenza shot is that you have a decreased ability to respond to that particular vaccine. So that keep that in mind. Fever is not always present in an older person if they get sick and they have an infection. More often, people become a little bit more confused, feel like their memory is going. They're not quite with it. They feel weaker. And that is very, very often when there's a pneumonia present. And as we talked about earlier, sometimes our drugs in our body react with antibiotics. Interactions occur. So for example, warfarin interacts with things. That's a blood thinner called Coumadin. And our dosing is different for infections when we give people antibiotics, because as I said earlier, our kidney, our kidney function is not as robust as it was. So let's talk a little bit about urinary tract infections, because if I had to say which one is more prevalent, pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, for me, it's almost a 50-50 at times. And you know, statistically, we're seeing it's the most common illness, but I do see a little bit of everything. Typical symptoms, if you've ever had an infection, are the, when you sit down to go to the, to the washroom, it burns, it hurts, it's, it's painful. You're going to the bathroom more often. You feel like you can't hold your urine. These are typical symptoms. What's really interesting as we get older is our nerves in our area where we pee are not as robust. They're not as firing as well as they used to. So we don't often feel that there's burning there. And this infection grows over time. And that's where we see people become confused or they're just, I just don't feel well today and I'm just not getting as, around as well as I used to. So how do we avoid something like this? 
And what I say to everyone all the time is increase your water intake. And when I say mindfulness, I mean, knowing your body is very powerful and saying to yourself, I don't feel well today. I'm weaker. Why am I weaker? Oh, I'm getting old. That to me is a huge red flag. When I hear patients say I'm getting old, I think, is that overnight that you feel this? Or is it just the last few days? And often they'll say, oh, just the last few days. So the first thing I'll do is I'll check their urine because I wanna know if they're brewing something in the background that they are not yet aware of. So this is just something in terms of why, how does this all tie together and why we fall? When we look at metabolics, when we look at people becoming ill, when you become weak, when you become ill, you are more prone to fall. So that's why I like to touch on things like the infections and why they make people weaker and what can happen. And again, when we tie that back to medications, when you're on all these medications and they may be interacting with one another, you can see where people start to feel weak. You can see where they start to feel unwell. So let's move on to pneumonia. I always stress when we're doing our health maintenance in the office that the flu vaccine is very important. The pneumonia vaccine is very important. There are two variants, a 13 and a 25. And what I recommend you do if you haven't had one, go to your doctor and say, I've never had one, but why do I need one? Because bottom line is our most common pathogen is our strep bug, and that can wreak a lot of havoc. And if we can immunize you against this form of pneumonia getting in there, then that gives you a leg up as well. Again, remember, when we're ill, this is when I, when I sit people down and I say, okay, how did you fall? They say, I tripped. But when I go over their blood work and we look at their chest x-ray and we see this whomping pneumonia in there, we have to take it back a step. And I say, well, this is the root cause. You didn't fall down because you were lazy. You didn't fall down because you didn't pick up your feet. You fell down because you're sick. And all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and they're like, oh, okay, I felt a little unwell because this pneumonia can sit in there and it can wreak havoc and you could just feel a little unwell. But inside it's like this, huge storm in there and you're just not aware of it. When I say oral hygiene is very important, think about it. Bacteria starts in our mouth, it moves down into our pharynx and then moves down into our lungs. But if your first line of defense is cleaning your mouth and being very, very rigorous or attentive or regular with your oral maintenance, meaning go to your dentist, find out if you have cavities and brushing regularly, flossing regularly, keeping your dentures clean if you have them. Not allowing that bacteria in there is the number one thing I say to nursing students. And I, I have to you know, say, I had a nursing student once who was discharging a patient with pneumonia. And I said, did he, did he clean his mouth this morning? And he goes, I don't know. And this was a brand new nursing student. And I said, listen, I want you to go look up why that's important. And then I want you to come back to me and tell me that you assisted this gentleman in helping him before he left. Because the bottom line is, if you don't understand this, we're gonna understand it together. Because to me, that is a huge, huge cause of injury and illness in our older population. And I have a friend who's a dental hygienist up north and her specialty is geriatrics. And she and I have these long chats all the time about oral hygiene and why it's so very important. And of course, we do have the coronavirus. It does have a pneumonia component to it. And I just wanted to touch on that in case people were wondering if in the coronavirus, are we seeing it? Yes, we see a different appearance from our regular pneumonia on the chest x-ray, but we do see pneumonias with it. So when I talk about health maintenance, I did touch on you know getting our pneumonia shot. But what I want to really stress is when you are trying to think, well, I feel good. I don't really need my three-month check or my four-month check with my, my primary care physician. I don't really need that. I'll tell you why it is important because blood pressure changes over time. If you were to lose 20 pounds, 10 pounds, five pounds, your blood pressure may change with that. And you may already be on three blood pressure medications. In the study that I mentioned before with a thousand people, they were able to remove some staggering statistic, like 10 to 15% of people were able to get off their blood pressure medications by the lifestyle changes that they made. So the reason why I want people getting those blood pressure checked is A, our blood pressure drops very quickly when we stand too quickly. B, we don't absorb the medications like we used to. 
you may not need the dose that you're on as you grow older because your body's adapted and changed and you may need to lower your dose. So I, I have a great little story. Older gentleman comes in, his blood pressure is 100 on 70, which is low. He's on a couple of blood pressure medications. One of them happened to be at night and it's a water pill. And the first thing I said was, can we take him off his water pill at night? Because I suspect he's getting up in the middle of the night having to pee, which isn't safe. You shouldn't have to do that. And B, look at his pressure. We've already lowered him way too much. And we had like a almost a mini argument because people were like, you can't take him off his blood pressure medications. And my first response is, why not? His body's changed. He's underweight. He no longer needs that dose anymore. And he, did he need a blood pressure? Most likely, a pill, most likely. I would never tell anyone to take it off altogether. But at the same time, we have to look at the whole person and say, where are you at right now? And what can we tweak? We also want people to get their lipid profiles checked because talked about it. as you grow older with atherosclerotic disease, when we do that risk assessment, we see your LDL too high or HDL not high enough and your cholesterol too high, we're going to give you a, a medication to lower that to lower your risk of heart disease. So health maintenance is part of looking at your lipids so that you can lessen your chance for health problems later on. Diabetes screening is very important. I'm, I'm sure all of us have been screened at one point or another. We like to look at a couple of things. We look at the sugar first thing in the morning before you've had something to eat. We look at the sugar overall. And we also look at a three month trend, which is called your A1C. And we can see over the last three months how you should be. And if you're over 6.5%, you're a diabetic. And if you're around 5758, you're pre-diabetic. So it's really important because the sooner we jump on someone who's a pre-diabetic, the greater the chance of keeping them off medication. If you're an already a diabetic and you've been that way for years, the chances of us being able to restore the insulin function in your pancreas is lessened. So we want to get people in screening early. We want people to be aware they can stop diabetes. So we talk about prevention. I'm injury prevention. This is part of you know, being mindful. This is part of taking care of ourselves. And why does diabetes lead us to falls? We develop kidney problems. We get dizzy. We develop heart problems. We have heart attacks. We develop things like vision problems that are part of long-term diabetes complications and feet problems. So we call them microvascular problems, not big problems, but little problems that add up and make people more apt to fall down. Colonoscopy, I think that is a, a pretty easy one when it terms to health maintenance. Most people over the age of 50 have had their colonoscopy. The number one the thing that you can do when we talk about cancer prevention is get a colonoscopy. And over the age of 70, 75, they may not recommend it for you anymore, but it's worth asking your physician. Breast cancer screening stops at certain women at 75 years of age. However, it doesn't stop us from getting screened yearly. And our AAA screening, if you have been a smoker or are a smoker, we want to know if you have an abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's also part of it. And finally, immunizations are very important. And I mentioned this before, getting our flu shot, getting our coronavirus shot, two big things right now, obviously, but don't forget your shingle shot. Don't forget your tetanus and your diphtheria if you're behind on that. And the next slide that I'm gonna show you here, and I, I, I realize it's very, very difficult to see, but this is the, these are the, what we call the schedules released by the CDC. And they list what they recommend and when you recommend it. So when I was talking about the pneumococcal conjugate, the PCV13, and I said 25 before, and I, I really, I correct myself, it's 23. You can see that one dose you can have from 19 to 64 years of age and 65 years of age and older, they'll consider it again. And then the PPSV23, again, ask your physician because if you have a pre-existing condition, they may want you to have it more than once. So double check with that. Hepatitis A, B, meningococcal, these are all scheduled doses by the CDC that are recommendations. And I threw up this one here, again, really difficult to see, so I apologize, but it tells us these people with conditions such as pregnancy, so pregnancy is here, immunocompromised, people that have HIV, people that have spleen problems, 
people that have renal disease. It will tell you exactly what they recommend for each. So for those of you that have concerns about any immunization, and that includes flu, coronavirus, any of the immunizations, talk to your specialist and talk to your doctors and see if you're eligible and what they recommend for you because they are laying this out very well for us as providers to be able to give some good clean information to the public. So that's the last slide I have. And I, I know that's a lot of information to take in in 35 minutes or actually it's 45 minutes at this point. So I might've gone over a little bit. So if people do have questions, willing to entertain any questions at all. And Al, direct me if I'm doing this wrong. I'm probably doing this wrong, but <laughs> I wanna make sure that we have any questions answered should they occur. And I don't see any questions at this point in time. If so, you have any questions, move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen and your yeah. uh, icons will come up. There's a Q&A function. Click on that. You can ask a question and, and we'll take care of it for you. If not, then we can move on. I think there will be a recording of this available on the website. Am I correct? <laughs> well, I understand. Yes. Okay. So if you have questions and you want to come back and hear my voice for another 45 minutes, you are walking barefooted. What a great question. Oh, <sighs> I, I have to be honest, not a fan. And I don't think podiatrists would be a fan either. And, and partially because there's a few reasons here. If I were to think of this critically and you were a diabetic, let's say, and I'm not sure if you are, or you're not, but if you are uh, a diabetic and you have feet problems anyway, you may not be able to feel what's underfoot. So you may very well walk on something that could get embedded in your foot and stay in your foot for a very long time. So that always worries me that people wanna walk barefooted. I don't think it has the support that we need either. Uh, sometimes people need arch support. Some people need this, the safety of a shoe and I'm one of them. I find that walking on my bare feet is actually more challenging. My feet are colder. I often don't feel if my feet are too cold. So it's not my number one thing. I think that if anyone is concerned about their feet in general, go to a podiatrist and go to your diabetic specialist for sure if you're diabetic. Uh, physiotherapists have some great exercises for strengthening lower, lower limbs. So that is something to think about as well. And Vesna asks, can an occupational therapist come to the house to help your home environment from falls? Thanks for a great, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. I think that having an occupational therapist, and it's a very valuable service if you can get it through your insurance. First of all, occupational therapists, that is a, a great part of their training, is looking at your immediate environment and helping you make changes. The other people that I really like coming to the home are called CAPS specialists. These are aging in place specialists, and now they're bonded. So you have to be careful that anyone says that they're CAPS, but they don't, they're not bonded because these are the professionals. They go through a very intensive course and many of them are contractors and they will come into your home and say, you know what I recommend? Lower this, raise this, change this, move this. And I think it's just such a fabulous thing. And I have referred many, many, many families to CAPS specialists because they've come in and looked at things that I didn't necessarily see at first. So if you have occupational therapist access They'll come in and do an environment scan with you because they'll keep your body in mind with your home. And the caps are really built, uh, there's a pun, they're really built to look at our home and say, what do we need to do here to make this safer? So hopefully that answers your question. And the next question, okay, what type of shoes, wear soles are best to prevent rubber or something else? I like rubber. And again, ask a foot specialist for this. I, I'm very terrified of older shoes because the rubber dries out and it cracks. And there was one talk that I did and I asked people to show me their shoes. And one lady said, I've had these shoes for 30 years. And I was like, how did they hold up first of all, but they were dried and cracked and she loved them because they molded to her feet. But the problem is when we do that heel toe strike, as I mentioned earlier, there's no flexibility. She was walking on two boards. So it did not help her feet in the long run and pro probably contributed to some of her other feet problems that she had. So rubber, good supportive shoes. I personally like Velcro, mainly because you're not bending over and you're not trying to tie things. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not, but yeah, rubber is very good. And, and 
shoes that are fitted for you by a professional or even better, or insoles that are put into your feet because they're meant for your feet versus you going to buy something off the pharmacy counter. I'm a little bit leery of those. I like them, but again, if you can get fitted at the pharmacy where you put your feet in the molds, even better. I'm, I'm a skier and a couple of years ago, I was in pain every time I put on this one boot and I thought it was the boot. And when I went to a boot fitter, he said, first of all, you can tell you've been on your feet for years. And second of all, you've got an incredibly high arch on the one foot, high on the other, but incredibly high. And he built um, an insert for me and pain was gone that afternoon. So for me, I was able to walk and I felt confident and I felt like I could stand up and I wasn't gonna cry and make it more dangerous for myself. So getting fitted is very important. So anonymous attendee says, do hormone reducing drugs taken for cancer prevention have a negative effect on liver and other organs? So what you're saying is something like tamoxifen or megase. Am I correct? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to say yes. So. All right, so if, for example, if you're on tamoxifen, I think what you have to look at is that any drug you take, any hormone replacement that you take for cancer prevention can be toxic to the liver. So the answer is yes. Can it be toxic to the kidneys? The answer is yes. So I think any drug you take can be toxic to the liver, but more so if these are cancer prevention, cancer type chemo drugs. And the reason for that is that they're, they're toxic. I have no explanation other than that's what we know about those particular drugs. And the other thing is, is that when we have breast cancer, for example, and we take things like tamoxifen, we take megase or megas, I'm not really sure the pronunciation here in the United States, but tamoxifen in particular can leach the calcium out of our bones. So we have to be very careful that if you are taking these particular medications that you are also having an understanding of calcium replacement that is so important in both men and women. So I have a friend who's um, had breast cancer and she's been on hormone, hormone therapy for a couple of years. And very early on, they discovered that she had osteoporosis. And the difference between osteoporosis and osteopenia is a difference. Osteopenia is a loss of bone density and osteoporosis is like, like the bone density is gone. So you have to be very careful and getting those calcium replacements, if you are in fact taking those hormones is probably the most important thing that I'd wanna talk about in relation to liver and organ, because you need that calcium to stay upright. Otherwise you're more prone to fractures. So it's all part of a bigger picture. So the answer is simply, yes, they are toxic, but you also have to look at things like calcium, magnesium and vitamin D replacement. In my last lecture, I talked about vitamin D more extensively. If you haven't had your screen for vitamin D, please do so. It's probably one of the best vitamin replacements that we can do to stay up on our feet and prevent falls. So I think that was the end of the questions. Am I right, Al? Oh, wait, there's another one. I'm a geriatric case manager. A frequent source of frustration is when play, uh, ah. So this, I guess people want to know what I just read that's so eyeing. So this particular case manager is very frustrated when the PCP does not reevaluate prescribed and over-the-counter medications relative to aging. And I 100% agree. And when I mentioned that little case study with the elderly gentleman, this was in relation to a group of us working on a case. And I have to tell you, out of 15 of us, I was the only one, and I'm not tooting my horn, who wanted to get rid of that one blood pressure medication, who also wanted him off his um, statin. Because one of the side effects of cholesterol medications, uh, and this occurs fairly early on after you've taken them, so don't think that if you've been on them for years, this is you right now, is one of the side effects early on is leg weakness is muscle weakness. And if I had a patient and I prescribed them a couple of months ago and they came in, they go, oh, my legs feel weak. I'd take them off statin right away because that's one of the most common side effects we get with cholesterol lowering medications. So out of the 15, I was the only one that wanted to pull them off a of statin and I was the only one that wanted to take them half dose to his blood pressure medication. And that surprised the heck out of me because I have been working with a geriatric population for years and I 
get very frustrated like you do, that this is something that is not addressed. And what we call reconciliation should occur at every visit. And I've said this to many of my patients, don't be afraid to remind me, I have to look at your medications. Do not be afraid to remind me of anything because I want to know what you're afraid of. I want to know what's running through your head. And even if it's the dumbest question in the world or so you think it is, it's not dumb to me because every question makes me think if you've got that question, there's five more people that have that question and it's not dumb. So to me, it's like, hey, sit down and address everything you take. And uh, the, this case manager brings up an excellent point. Over-the-counter medications react with almost everything you're taking. So before you go and I'm guilty, you pull that supplement off the shelf and you think, oh, I've heard about ginkgo. ginkgo. It's going to improve my memory. Or I've heard about vitamin E. It's going to do this. And I've heard about fish oil. And I heard it's going to go do this for me. Double check with your pharmacist and your physician. Does this interact with anything else that I'm taking? Because it may very well be reacting with your blood thinner if you're on one. So it's so important that we look at the whole picture. And I, I, I love the fact that we have access to vitamins that we have to herbs supplements but at the same time i'm frightened of it because there are too many of us and i'm guilty at times you know here we go back in the cart it's going to make me feel better i'm going to prevent myself from getting coronavirus because i'm going to take quercetin i'm going to take vitamin c i'm going to take zinc and that scares me too that people are just taking these things without understanding what is good for them and how it affects them as they grow older so i'm i'm glad that you like that point because that's a that's obviously something that I'm a little obsessed with and probably not healthily obsessed, but I am. So that is, I think, the end of the questions. Let me just scroll down and make sure. Yes, that's it. So I really appreciate people coming today. That's, uh, that's very nice of everyone. And I think that is the end of our time. Am I correct, Al? Unless uh, you have a few more things you want to say. No, I could talk all day and I, I think people might be irritated, but no, I, that's about all that I wanted to talk about today. So I really appreciate Greenwich Hospital giving me the opportunity and people coming to listen. It means a lot to me. It's obviously something I'm very passionate about. I work with people in the older population every day and I'm getting older and I want to not only preach it, but I'm trying to live it as well. So I do appreciate people participating with the questions and, and attending today. So thank you, everyone.